Okay, the Shroud of Turin. I didn't know much about this. I still don't know a ton, but I know that it's one of those things that has been kind of, there's been a lot of misinformation about it and a lot of skepticism uh, and perhaps a lot of false uh, confidence. So let's see, Daniel has researched this and it's super interesting. Um, reserve your judgment until uh, you've heard all the this, this stuff because I I also was skeptical. But all right, so Daniel, what, what is the Shroud of Turin? So it's a linen cloth that measures three and a half feet wide and 14 feet long. So it's, you get a mental image of what that, it's pretty large. Um, it's three feet three, by 14 feet. Yeah. Jeez. It can be positively traced back to the 1357. So there's like a documented history of the cloth since that date. That's when it was first publicly displayed in France. It's called the Shroud of Turin because for the past several centuries it's been housed in Turin, Italy. So that's why it's called the okay. Shroud of Turin. When you say positively dated, you don't mean like carbonated. You mean you can trace it, trace it back to where it lived, essentially. Yeah, like where where the cloth was before 1357 is kind of an ambiguous thing to determine. But there's no mystery as to where the cloth has been since 1357. Got it. Okay. Yeah. That's a good thing to clarify. Um, what's special about the shroud is that because of the unique characteristics of what's on the shroud, a lot of people are convinced that the shroud is Jesus's authentic burial cloth. Um, imprinted on the cloth is, an, is the image of a man lying on his back with his hands across the pelvic area. And uh, you know, the, the person who's on the cloth can be examined. So the man was roughly five feet 10 and weighed 175 pounds. Um, I think it's pretty cool that you can determine that, you know, just based on the image that's in there. Right. People who believe the shroud was Jesus' burial cloth believe the man whose image is on the cloth is Jesus himself. And there are a lot of different theories as to, you know, where the shroud likely was before 1357. They usually trace it back to around the year 1000 in Constantinople and further back to Edessa in modern day Turkey all the way to the first century in Palestine. The most popular theory is the Mandelian, I think is how you pronounce it, I'm not certain. It's M-A-N-D-Y-L-I-O-N. Uh, this was the most important relic of the Byzantine Empire. And it was first discovered in 525 AD and went missing after the sack of Con sacking of Constantinople. And it's widely believed that the Shroud and the Mandelian are the same relic, uh. just by two different names. Um, the interesting thing that, uh, that I discovered when I started research this, it wasn't until the Mandelian was discovered that the traditional image of Jesus that we know today became widespread. In the first five centuries of Christian art, there's no uniformity at all in how Jesus is portrayed. He's usually portrayed out of beard. Got it. And the traditional picture of what Jesus looks like uh, is the face you see on the shroud. So much so that when a Byzantine icon is laid over the shroud image, every detail is an exact match. Wow. Like the, the, everything is a complete matchup. That's fascinating. Um, Do you want to like show? So there's a book yeah, here, yeah, sure. and then Daniel can this show you the a, shroud as well. So this is a photograph, uh, like a photographic negative of the the shroud and we'll talk more about why this is special but this is the uh this is the, the image of the front and this is the image of the back and um these marks here are where the there was a fire that um the shroud was saved from those are scorch marks um and we'll, we'll talk more about that image but it's it's pretty pretty amazing do you want to show the book um, that you're oh yeah it's the, the book is called the resurrection of the shroud um, by Mark Antonacci. Um, this is the most thorough book that I'm aware of on the topic. It, it covers everything you could ever possibly want to know about the Shroud. It was written about 20 years ago. And I think there hasn't been a, a lot of change as far as research since then. So it's, it's probably still one of the more up-to-date books. And, and you can apply all due skepticism uh, to the shroud, like those, those things are addressed in this book, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, so, um, I, the resurrection of the shroud is an important thing to point out because it was essentially written off after the carbon dating, which you'll talk about in a little mm -hmm. bit, but this book covers new scientific, medical, and archeological evidence to yeah. address those, um, those questions. Yeah. Um, so, I was first introduced to the Shroud by reading a book by um, D. James Kennedy, and he, he referenced this book as like a, a good book to re research if you wanted more information. 
And um, D. James Kennedy is actually a Presbyterian minister. He uh, had a ministry in Tech in uh, Florida for many years. And I was a little surprised to hear him talk about it because I'd always been under the impression this was like just a Roman Catholic relic that only Roman Catholics really were interested in or had any reason to be interested in. But uh, D. James Kennedy kind of helped explain why it's something that all Christians ought to look into because the, the question is what really is at stake as far as the research is whether the shroud is a piece of evidence for the resurrection. Yeah. And, and of course, that's not a Catholic doctrine. It's a doctrine that's in common for all Christians. Um, skeptics say that the shroud was a medieval forgery uh, dating back to you know, 1300s. That's how I was introduced to it as you yeah. know, when I was younger. At, yeah, I thought, well, it's just another Catholic relic among many yeah. that are easily disputable and then when that evidence came out with the carbon dating I was like oh well gosh okay yeah the uh, there was a test in 1988 a carbon dating test that um, seemed to indicate the shroud was only date, only traceable back to the 1300s um, of course people who believe in the authenticity of the shroud question the reliability of that test and we'll, we'll get to that more later um, so I guess if we can just talk a little bit about some of the Evidence for the Shroud's authenticity, which is in this book as well as the D. James Kennedy book. Um, first of all, there's a lot of evidence that points to the Shroud originating in the Middle East rather than Europe. And I think that's important to start because mm -hmm. if it was a medieval forgery, it would have been Europe. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a pollenologist, someone who studies the pollens or spores produced by seed-bearing plants, so cool. studied the Shroud <laughs> and found that the vast majority of the pollen found on the Shroud were from Palestine. If nothing else, this proves the Shroud was at some point in Palestine. There's no record post-1357 of the Shroud being anywhere except Europe. So there's no... If it was created in Europe in 1357 or around that time, it never has been anywhere but Europe. And that raises questions about the pollens. Microscopic studies of the Shroud, which is made of linen, show that there are tiny pieces of cotton woven into the cloth. And this indicates that the Shroud was woven on a loom used to weave cotton. And cotton was not produced in medieval Europe, but it was plentiful in the Middle East. So it's also worth noting that ethnologists have studied the image of a man on the cloth and determined that he was a Semite, having the facial characteristics of a Jewish man. Say ethnologists mm -hmm. that determine ethnicity? Yeah, they, they can study the, the facial shape and determine okay. the, the ethnic background. It's also been discovered through the use of microscopes that coins were placed on the eyes of a dead man, as was the first century Jewish custom, apparently. And these coins were leptons, which were minted by Pontius Pilate in Judea between 29 and 31 AD. And they can tell that because of the imprint on the cloth? When studied microscopically, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, again, if the shroud's a forgery, the forger went to ridiculous lengths to give the shroud an, era, an aura of authenticity, doing things that no 14th century person could have possibly even noticed. You know? Yeah, they wouldn't have known to do it. No, yeah, they would have had no reason to work to build those kind of things up. Of course, you know, proving, even if you could prove it came from the Middle East, that, and if you could prove it was a first century burial cloth, that still wouldn't prove that it belonged to Jesus. So that's kind of a separate question. What evidence is there that this is Jesus' burial cloth? Um, so there seems to be plenty of credible evidence to suggest that just writing it off as a 13th century European forgery is, is not really an adequate explanation. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that really the only compelling evidence to, to date it to medieval Europe is the, is the carbon test. But given how there's so many other compelling pieces of evidence that point the other direction, it's kind of unwise to let one thing overshadow a lot of other things, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and that doesn't mean you should be skeptical about carbon dating in general. I mean, everybody agrees that it's not you know, foolproof, completely foolproof. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the evidence that suggests that it was Jesus' burial cloth Based on the image in the cloth, it's clear that the man who'd been wrapped in the cloth had suffered a very violent death by crucifixion. He's unclothed. He's been horribly flogged with a Roman flagrum. Um, this is a whip with little bits of lead or bone tied to the end. And the purpose of flogging someone with this whip was to cut deeply into the flesh. And the man in the shroud was whipped more than 120 times with flagrum, um, mm. pretty much from from the neck all the way down to the ankles, the, the entire back. Like, I bring this up. The uh, you get close. These these little marks on the back. All these are are um, flagrum wounds. And um, 
image, you know, to get an image of what that would be, like think about the Mel Gibson movie, The Passion of the Christ. That's that's what's depicted on the shroud. And um, there are also wound marks, wound marks all over his forehead, indicating that sharp objects were pressed hard into his head, causing him to bleed profusely all over the face. Looks like part of the beard has been plucked out. He's been beaten in the face, and his left eye is almost swollen shut. His nose has been broken, and there's also evidence of cuts on both knees and abrasions across his shoulders, which look like he carried a heavy weight across his shoulders. These, and to be clear, right, these aren't, this isn't somebody looking at it and be like, well, it kind of looks like that. This, these are experts, yeah. uh, forensic experts, like determining through careful yeah. study of this that, that those things are true. And also, these are findings not just from Christian uh, scientists and uh, and medical professionals, but also just uh, secular ones yeah. as well, right? Yeah, and they they who have no incentive to yeah. to prove it true. And like no no relic in in history has ever been subjected to the scrutiny of the shroud. Like it's been studied particularly the last 150 years or so with the, the, the advance of more modern things like microscope. I don't remember microscopes were invented, but it's been studied microscopically a lot. Um, that's that's another thing that sets it apart. Like most most relics don't have enough credibility to even warrant that kind of investigation. Mm -hmm. But the shroud's kind of in a category by itself. Um, the man has nail prints in his wrists and in his feet. Mm -hmm. The left foot is placed over the right foot, and a single spike pierced both feet. The nail prints are the beginning of the wrist, and uh, rather than the palm of the hand, which was the standard way crucifixions were portrayed in medieval art. Um, you know, crucifixion was suspended in the fourth century when Constantine was emperor. And so most of the medieval paintings you see of crucifixions were about a thousand years after people had actually witnessed crucifixions. So there was a common belief that it was the palm that the nails were driven through. Modern studies have shown that nails driven into the palm wouldn't have kept a person affixed to a cross. Or just like um, ripped through the hand? Yeah, they actually did a test. This is mentioned in the book where they took a cadaver and they, they nailed it to a cross. and yeah, just the body just fell through and the hand was left behind. It's wow. just not strong enough to keep the whole body. Oh, so it didn't like rip through that way. It ripped through, like just like fell off it's, the face of the... That's That was my understanding, okay. yeah. Um, but that was not commonly known in medieval Europe where crucifixions had, had ceased so long before. So again, if the shroud's a forgery, it was created by someone who somehow knew that what modern scholarship has revealed about crucifixions, um, which is you know, very interesting. Um, people... There was a misconception too with translations. We talked about Jesus' hands being pierced, but apparently, and I'm definitely not a Greek scholar, but the uh, the way the word hand is used in the New Testament Greek, it refers to anything below the elbow. And so the word, what they mean by hand, so they don't just mean what we think of as hand. They think of below here as well. Um, there's also a spear mark in the side of the man, and the wound is one and three fourths inches long and seven sixteenths of an inch wide. The exact measurement of a first century Roman lancia. Um, there's evidence that both blood and water flowed from this side wound. And based on the apparent slow flow of blood, it was determined that the spear wound was administered after the person had already died. The blood surrounding the wound wasn't pumped out by beating hard, but rather slowly oozed out. It's crazy that they can determine all that. Yeah, it is. It's, it it's, is. Just, it's <clears throat> amazing like how detailed these studies can be. So it seems like, I mean, from what you've said so far that it is clear that thinking it's a 13th century forgery would would be difficult um, and that it's also clear that it represents a, a person who was crucified and uh, who was Semitic Jewish and um, who was badly beaten but I mean there were thousands and thousands of Jewish people crucified and so you're, I guess you're getting to what makes it more specifically um, related to the Jesus we see in the Gospels, yeah. the spear being one of those things. Yeah, the spear, you know, it wasn't typical for crucifixion victims to be uh, wounded with a spear. So that's, that's one thing that sets this apart from just a typical crucifixion. The legs of the man in the shroud were not broken. The legs can be studied and there's no indication of of a break that would be apparent if, if the bone had been snapped. That, that was common procedure for crucifixion victims. Um, and the Gospels mentioned that Jesus' legs weren't broken, but he died before the, the soldiers came to do that. Looking at all these features in the Shroud, D. James Kennedy said these things are com 
quote, completely in harmony in every single detail of what we know historically and biblically of the death and crucifixion of Christ. Hmm. Um, another interesting piece of evidence, there's a cloth in Spain, the Sidarium of Oviedo, which is believed to be the cloth used to wrap the face of Christ in his tomb. And scientists have determined that the bloodstains in the Sidarium match the bloodstains on the shroud. That's so nuts. again, if it's a if it's a forgery, somebody made a point to make sure the same blood was on both of these pieces that are not even in the same country. You know, it, it just shows an extraordinary length to go to to give an aura of authenticity if it's if it's not authentic. And we're Daniel's pointing out a lot of facts that cover you know decades of research and all sorts of different studies. But all of the things that you're mentioning are verifiable, yeah, right? That yeah. they can go research it in, uh, on the internet or in a book or scholarly literature. Yeah, this is like I said, the book that there's a lot of books out there, but this is the one that kind of has all the, the information kind of in one location. I mean, I think you could probably find all this information in a plethora of books, but this kind of has it all together. Um, Does it have mm -hmm. studies cited? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. There's charts and graphs and the there have been a, a lot of attempts over the years to duplicate the shroud, like to take um, to take you know, either statues or, or dead bodies and try to create a replica of the shroud. And, and there's been no um, there's no there's been no way to, to, to copy it or to, to create another image with the same properties using all the 21st century technology we have at our disposal. So yeah, it, I mean, I mean, you obviously can't like, quote unquote prove this question at the end of the day, but I think you, you can almost prove that there's no natural explanation. Mm -hmm. You can at least prove that if we don't know what it is, it has to remain a mystery. You know, like you can't say, well, this answers all the questions. There, there isn't any kind of natural explanation that just answers all the questions. Yeah. Um, there, so, there are very few things that you can actually prove conclusively. Um, yeah. And I think most of them are in mathematics. And that's yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, w when you're discussing something like this, you're, you're dealing with probability, you know. Um, another thing that kind of pushed me over the edge when I was still kind of on the fence, the dirt on the cloth has been shown to be an exact match for the dirt from the rock shelf at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, showing that if this wasn't Jesus' burial cloth, at least the cloth was at some point in the tomb of Jesus, um, which just kind of blows your mind if you think yes. about that. Yes, um, So, So what produced the image on the shroud? Like, um, that's, hey guys, this this blew my mind. This is what, one of the craziest things to me. Yeah, th this is this is where you, you, you could if you could prove that it was a first century Jewish man, one among thousands who was crucified. Like then the question was what produced the image and, and kind of the thing that makes the shroud unique is it, it appears to have a supernatural explanation for how the image got there. So like I said, no artifact in history has been subject to the intense testing and scrutiny the shroud has been subject to. The conclusive finding is that there's no pigment, no dye, no ink, no foreign substance of any kind that could produce the incredibly detailed image of a man on the shroud. There's no indication of brushwork anywhere. So the, the medieval forgery theory usually was that was done by a medieval painter, hmm. but there's there's no there's no paint that produced the image. So here's here's what they determined. Some of the fibrils of the individual linen threads are dehydrated. This gets kind of technical, but this dehydrating process this dehydrating produces the yellow tint that produces the shroud image. And each thread of the cloth is made of two to three hundred fibrils, and only the top two or three are dehydrated, so it's a very, very shallow dehydration. Basically, this means that these particular threads age at a slightly different rate than the rest of the threads in the cloth. And that may sound kind of, what, so what? So the naked eye can see very little of the image, and it wasn't until the 1898 photograph that was taken in the shroud that, the, that um, all the graphic details were, were apparent for the first time. And like I said, this is this is a photographic, this is a photographic negative, which becomes a positive. If you were to go to Turin, Italy and, and look at it, what you see with your naked eye is much less distinct. Um, Wasn't there one in there that shows that? Not in this book, but I, there's one on, online. You can easily okay. just go to Google Images. Um, so the basically the photograph, which brought out all these graphic details, kind of showed that the the shroud itself is a photographic negative. Um, and of course in 1357, photography had never been dreamed of. So that, that's, another, um, that's another mysterious thing to grapple with. The shroud was wrapped around the body of a dead man who was very bloody. That's 
that's not really questioned. And there's no evidence of decomposition on the cloth. There's also no evidence the body was unwrapped, <laughs> which would have caused smear marks all over the cloth. Yes. So what that yeah. shows is, number one, the man's body was in the cloth no more than a few days. Number two, it didn't stay in the cloth and decompose. And number three, it was never unwrapped. So what happened? So, so where does that leave us? So how did, <laughs> how, did the body, how did the body get out of the cloth? And there, there simply is no natural explanation for how the image was imprinted or how the man's body was removed from the cloth. Uh, so the, the theory that, that Mark Antonacci points out, this is kind of his, the climax of the book when he presents his own theory. The conjecture is that it appears the body literally passed through the cloth, that it transformed from matter into light leaving behind a burst of radiation similar to what happens during an atomic bomb. And there and are imprints this, like that in Japan, yeah. yeah. And it was this burst of radiation similar to what happens during a bomb uh, that uh, is responsible for certain fibrils becoming dehydrated and aging at a different speed than the rest of the cloth. Um, the image wouldn't have been immediately apparent if that's the case. That, that ex helps explain why no one in the New Testament seems to have been aware of any image because the image only becomes more apparent as the cloth ages. So it would have been something gradually would have been determined. Didn't you say like daily it's becoming darker? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, I think uh, it wasn't until the, the cloth was photographed in the 19th century that the full body image was even known about. Because the only thing that could really be seen in the medieval times with the naked eye was this faint image of a face. And that's what the Mandelian was. It was believed to be a cloth, but it covered Jesus' face. Okay. And um, there was never any any awareness that any other image, other than a facial image, was even there. Um, so what about the carbon dating test? That's the big thing that people yes. bring up. Um, D. James Kennedy, in his book, pointed out uh, Mark Antonacci's research about carbon dating, and he lists several examples of of uh, just well documented you know, errors of carbon dating, and that, and that just helps to show that it's not a, an exact science. And some of these examples are kind of funny. Living snail shells were dated to be 26,000 years old. <laughs> a newly killed seal was dated 1,300 years old. One-year-old leaves were once dated as 400 years old. And a Viking horn was dated to the year 2006. So that doesn't mean that it's not a basically reliable science, but it just shows that, I mean, there are errors, obviously. Yes. And basic concerns about the reliability of carbon dating aside, there are other reasons to believe the test specifically on the Stroud is unreliable. Many of the not leading, carbon dating in general, but just the test that was on yeah. the on the shroud. Okay. Yeah, many of the leading shroud experts petitioned that a variety of samples from a variety of different parts of the cloth be taken. Uh, instead, all the samples used for the testing were from one narrow piece of the cloth, and it's well known in the shroud, which has been transported to various locations over the years and survived a number of church fires, has been patched and repaired. And so, skeptics of the test sometimes argue that what was tested was not actually part of the original cloth at all, but part of the patching that was done in the Middle Ages, which you know, is very possible. Mm -hmm. um, so to kind of wrap that up, Christians believe in Jesus' resurrection because of the eyewitness testimony of the apostles, uh, because of the sacred writings they left. And the doctrine of the resurrection doesn't at all stand or fall with the shroud, but mm -hmm. the best explanation for what created the image is a supernatural explanation. And all the details of the image strongly do point to Jesus. So I think it would be unwise to ignore the shroud or treat it like it's just some other holdover from medieval superstition. It deserves a lot of careful attention. Um, so It's fascinating. I highly recommend the book. It's a great book. Yeah. I, that's, I don't know how you guys are feeling about it having watched this, but after I talked with Daniel about it and kind of probed skeptically because <laughs> I was a little in. I was a little incredulous at first, like, there's no way. Um, I'm, I'm just amazed at the possibility. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I mean, because from a Christian perspective, to just imagine the moment of the resurrection, his body dematerializing, just passing through the cloth, and it kind of makes your head spin a little bit. Yeah, but it makes total yeah. sense when you think of, like, um, uh, uh, radioactive, you know, the science of radioactivity. Yeah. And, uh, I, mean, I don't remember any details about this, but there were, I was reminded of this story when I read this book. When I was in high school history class learning about World War II, there's a, a building in Japan, either Hiroshima or Nagasaki, where a man who was killed by the bomb, his shadow 
he, like he melted basically when the bomb fell, but mm. the shadow was permanently imprinted on the wall. And it's still there. Like I mean, this guy died 75 years ago, but his shadow is still there because of just the weirdness of what radiation can do, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems to be kind of a similar thing that happened with, with the cloth. And this image is permanently there, you know? And it wasn't painted there. <laughs> yeah. So. And I like how you say that our, the reason that we think that um, Jesus's resurrection is a compelling and believable historical event isn't necessarily because of this cloth. You know, there, there are um, other reasons that stand a much greater scrutiny, like the, um, the eyewitness testimony of the apostles and the sacred writings they left, like you said. Uh, but this is super fun. Yeah, it really <laughs> it's is. just it's really cool. And it's just really cool to think I mean, that, you know, if it is legitimate, I mean, people have, all, have always wondered, especially Christians, what Jesus' face looked like because there's no physical description of any sort in the Gospels. And it's kind of kind of neat to think that it's, it's possible and even likely that this is roughly what Jesus' face would have looked like. And uh, it matches up the, with the common medieval you know, drawing of what his face looked like. There's a picture in this book, I don't remember what page, but where a medieval icon is like overlaid into the shroud and like every, every detail matches the shape of the nose, the shape of the eyes, the, the width and everything. It's fascinating. So uh, it doesn't, you know, you could always prove that, you could always argue that the, the icons you know, led to the creation of the shroud image, but it's much more likely that the reverse is true. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's so cool. Another thing, sometimes people are turned off by this kind of thing because the shroud has been abused. Like some people have kind of made an idol out of it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's a whole other separate theological debate to distinguish between veneration and worship. But yeah. uh, but some people have worshipped the shroud. And uh, of course, believing it's authentic and, and thinking that you know, the evidence points to that doesn't, doesn't mean you, you should cross the line and worship it. It just means it's a really cool thing to, to be aware of, you know. Yeah. Well, thanks, guys. Let us know if you have any thoughts and uh, research it. Check it out. See what you think. You know, don't, like I said on Reading Rainbow, don't take my word for it. <laughs> take his word for yeah. it. <laughs>